We're honored to have Dr. Barnaby Marsh as our guest speaker. Dr. Barnaby Marsh is the co-founder of Saint Partners and has privately advised many of the world's most generous individuals on how to achieve greater philanthropic impact. To date, Barnaby has advised on the structuring of hundreds of new and innovative projects globally, with aggregate funding totaling more than $2 billion. For many years, Barnaby worked with the late investing pioneer, Sir John Templeton, to develop novel philanthropic strategies and was a key creativity leader in the development of the John Templeton Foundation. Barnaby's technical background is in complex risk assessment and decision strategy. As a scholar, he tested various risk assessment heuristics while holding appointments at New College, Oxford, the Max Planck Institute, uh, Berlin, and the Hebrew University, Jerusalem. Earlier in his career, he developed advanced risk solutions for a monitor corp company and Citibank, among others. He currently holds visiting appointments at Harvard University and the Institute for Advanced Study, Princeton. He also holds an AV summa cum laude from Cornell University College of Arts and Sciences, where he was a Cornell College Scholar, and a doctor from Magdalen College, Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really honored to have you here as our guest. Thank you, Joyce. A pleasure to be here. Great. So I guess jumping right into questions, in your experience allocating hundreds of millions of dollars to philanthropic projects, what framework did you utilize to prioritize and evaluate project efficacy? Well, I found that the key to the success of many projects is centered around two points. First, around the leadership, what kind of people, the types of people that are um, in charge of a project and running it. And you want inspirational, clever people who can solve problems well. And then also the ideas that are behind the project. So, for instance, where could this go? What could this project, you know, become? How can it excite other people? And so you can look at the track record of people who are involved in the project you can ask, do they have the potential to make extraordinary things happen? Uh, frequently, there isn't a good track record to go on, and so we look at other things, like what resources they have, who they know, whether they have other types of resources that they can tap into. And those sorts of dimensions give us a picture for uh, the possibilities of success uh, for a project. Great. And just given the fact that, you know, especially working with these really large philanthropic organizations and just the vast amount of grant applications out there and the, you know, thousands of different nonprofits that are vying for these funds, how are you able to really, you know, go through and, you know, out of hundreds, select the few specific ones that were compelling? Well, it's different for every organization. And, you know, a lot of the most innovative work isn't necessarily done by large foundations or large uh, philanthropic operations, but by sm smaller groups of very dedicated individuals. So, again, we always look uh, – I think it's key to look at the, the people in charge, look at the leadership, look at their ideas, talk to them about where they see things going. And uh, pretty quickly you can get a sense for uh, the potentials and another thing you can do is go through sort of scenarios uh, with them and talk with them about, well, you know, if you had a million dollars tomorrow, what you, would you do with that? And by listening to the types of answers they give, you can get a sense for how they think about leveraging money and, how they, and other types of resources that are ultimately needed to make any project successful. Great. And I, um, one of the key challenges in philanthropy is that countries and areas of greatest need are often the most complex, risky, and difficult to deliver effective aid. In your philanthropic efforts, how did you balance these competing objectives? That's a great question, Jason. Thanks for asking it. Um, what I'd like to do is, uh, from the point of view of the philanthropist now, is to take – philanthropists generally like – to sort of play safe, you know, especially foundations because there's boards of people and don't want to make mistakes. But I think it's really important to take risks and to go in new directions. And to do that, one way to do that is to, to diversify, to try a lot of different things, uh, sometimes on a small scale, and to see what the results are, and also to work with great problem solvers, you know, people who are not only able to articulate their visions and their ideas clearly on paper, 
but who are able to adjust to changing circumstances um, with ease and creativity um, really does, I think, often translate into great philanthropic projects and great philanthropic value. And just to follow up on this, like, you know, there's clearly venture capital for private capital, but you, as you mentioned, there's quite a bit of risk aversion in philanthropy. And if you're taking, like, USAID, World Bank, or, you know, large institutional funding, there's much less tolerance for failure. Like, have you seen um, new forms of venture capital or um, more willingness to fund, like, more interesting novel ways of philanthropy, even if it is, like, potentially, you know, higher probability of failure, but also big potential for change? Sure. I mean, I, I always, one of the things I always try to encourage the people I work with, who are typically billionaire-type clients, is to start small and to scale very carefully and to observe very quickly uh, how how different types of projects uh, re relate to and adapt to change. And one way to scale is to outsource a lot, a lot of the overhead, you know, a lot of the management of projects, and to be nimble, to work with others, to share information. Uh, there are just lots of trade-offs, though. And so I think the learning is the best when different individuals share not only not only know-how, but also solutions and possibilities. And that's something I'm always trying to encourage. Whenever I meet anybody, I'm always trying to ask them, well, what have you seen before? What do you like? And, you know, for your own philanthropic vision, where do you see this going, you know, if it's successful? And how do you get there? And uh, in that way, I think that um, – just by by diversification and by trying different things and trying different solutions, you can actually diversify, diversify away a lot of the risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that definitely um, makes a lot of sense. And I just like taking the opposite view. What are some examples of like systemic failures that you see in risk management for like nonprofits or foundations? Yeah, I mean, all the time you see, and it's it's sort of pathological, actually. You see a, a case, cases all the time where both the people who are leading philanthropic projects and the funders as well are overly optimistic. And that sort of sets things up for failure because if the goals are set in a, too, in a way that's too lofty and you can't reach those, then you have donor disappointment and you can also have demoralization of the people who are involved on the project. So I think for sure one one issue of a, that generates a lot of systemic failures is a lack of realism. Um, there's also sometimes a lack of feedback about what is really happening. You know, people like to talk about, you know, maybe the one child that was helped by, by a project or you use examples that resonate emotionally um, within their constituencies. Uh, instead of sort of taking a tough look at things and looking at what's, you know, really working well and why and what isn't working and, you know, well and why. And I guess the last thing I add to that, Joyce, is that, and this is surprising to me to some, as someone who studies risk you know, professionally, is that amongst the people who are the funders of projects, they're, very, they're often very astute in their understandings of risk in the context of business and in the context of their investments. But when it comes to the philanthropy, they, they, they don't really tap into those skills as much as they should. They, they, they rely more on emotions and gut feelings. And sometimes that really leads to uh, a high degree of risk exposure and then sometimes project failure. Too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a that's an issue that's actually very close to urology, where you know people often will do so much diligence on their financial investments, but then for a lot of their um, social contributions and philanthropy, it's like you know what do they say? The road to um, hell is paved with the skulls of those with good intentions. So <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, actually, just on that topic about the lack of realism and lack of feedback, like. You know, what have you seen, like, you know, recently in terms of both from the funder and the grantee side, 
in terms of like processes and um, changes that have occurred, especially since this dialogue on impact evaluation, which is the theme of our podcast, and also this focus on accountability with seeing the MIT Poverty Action Lab and bringing in research. Like, you know, have you seen a lot of change here? Have you seen like more more efforts towards like alignment in on on this front? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I mean, it depends on a you know on a case by case basis and. A lot of that depends on how good the information is and how easy it is to collect in that information and that data choice. But I can say that um, one thing that is definitely uh, we can always ask for any project is, is, okay, well, this is the amount of effort that you put in and this is the amount of funding that you put in. And then, well, what changed? You know, what what changed more than what would have otherwise changed if you wouldn't have taken that those steps? So almost looking at it from the point of view as a scientist looking at an intervention, like a medical intervention. And then once you do that, you can make an assessment of well, how much that you know how much that change cost and how much effort that took, and whether there are other competing ways that you could use to achieve the same type of change or not. And um, I'm always surprised myself when, I, when I'm looking at a project and I ask those sorts of questions. Um, the number of sort of blank stares I get when people haven't really thought of even that, you know, what's actually changed from the last time from when we started. You know, they may have a story or two, some anecdotal evidence, but I think it's really important to have a sense of, you know, a realistic sense of what, what is changing and why so that you can focus your, you know, the skills and the efforts of teams, which are often volunteer, you know, volunteers in, in nonprofit, focus those scarce resources just more effectively so they can, you know, those efforts can be, uh, lead to more efficient outcomes. Great. And, um, you know, clearly you have a lot of experience from the institutional side, but how can individual donors also hold nonprofit projects accountable to meeting their objectives. Um, what type of due diligence do you think that individuals can actually do um, and take that scientific approach to, to judging like where their dollar can make the most impact? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it can be sort of as simplistic or as complex as you want to make it. But one thing I advise donors that I work with to do is just be specific about the type of change that you hope to see and to have an agreement with the nonprofit you're working with about how it will be measured and, you know, to have specific deadlines and targets for reaching those, those targets. Um, also, you know, encouraging, encouraging those uh, who are working directly on the front lines, not, to fall in the trap of being overly optimistic. You know, they're encouraged them to smart starts to scale slowly, uh, to anticipate uh, things going wrong, um, and to have a really open and honest channel of communication so that when things do go wrong, um, you know, there isn't a sense of to sort of plaster that over, mm -hmm. but to be honest about it and to try to find, you know, better ways forward. So, I really do think that accountability is is um, it's very important, um, but it's it's easier when there's a good rela working relationship between those who are funding a project and those who are trying to advance things in the field on the front line, which is mm -hmm. often a lot more difficult, as you know, than uh, than it first seems. Mm -hmm. Great. And for our listeners, what are some examples of, you know, top-notch nonprofits that you highly recommend or that, you know, you think are really differentiated in the impact and in the uh, accountability and success that they've achieved? Oh, well, there are many. And I work with many different types of institutions, uh, ranging from, well, sort of grassroots type institutions to institutions of higher education. Um, and some of those are very large, so you have a lot of variation within how how people actually carry out their missions. But if there's one idea that I think it's important, I always try to communicate, it is that, you know, when there's a goal out there that you're aiming for and you're trying to reach, more often than not, there's more than one way to reach it. And some people, you know, do things more through, you know, 
uh, through technical analysis. Others work more with, you know, socially through networks and mobilize resources through people that they know. And there's not always one right way to reach a certain goal. And that's why I look at the, the, at the core leadership team and the talents they have and the track records they have, um, because that can actually often tell you a lot more than looking simply at the business plan or simply at the idea. Because, again, there might not be one way to get from point A to point B. There will be seven different ways. And which way is right is right dependent on what you have to work with and what type of people are involved and so forth. So um, I like to think that way and, and sort of broadly and then um, – Watch what people can do. You know, watch what talented people can do, especially those who are good at solving problems. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Switching gears, you recently wrote a book, How Luck Happens, Using the Science of Luck to Transform Work, Love, love and Life, in which elements of luck can be achieved through preparedness. What are some of the key actions that individuals can take to make themselves luckier? <laughs> yeah, it's a fun book to write. And, you know, I, I come back, back over risk and taking chances. Um, but also I, um, I was wondering, well, why I have been so lucky in so many areas of my life. And um, in this book, one of the things that I, I discovered with my co-author, Janice Kaplan, was that the idea of working hard and developing your talents is almost never going to be enough uh, in a competitive world. <laughs> um, working hard and developing your talents positions you to take chances and to be lucky, but it doesn't assure, assure success necessarily. So what I, we do in the book is explore some of the ways, some of the pathways that people have to gain an edge in, in, a, in a competitive world. And again, that type of an edge is different for different types of people. So for instance, some people, a lot of luck will come from finding creative ways to create new types of opportunities that others miss. Um, and that might be something like giving yourself more swings at the bat. So if things go wrong, you can, you can have another try and another try and another try. Um, kind of like, you know, if you wanted to uh, flip three heads in a row, if you have a coin, you want to flip three heads in a row, you're more likely to be able to do that if you have lots and lots of flips of the coin. So there are some areas where, where that can be done and we can create more possibilities and more opportunities for ourselves. For other people, though, Success in creating luck might come in from very different uh, different activities. For instance, like being active in social networks, increasing your village visibility, helping others, and being the sort of person that's useful and good to have around that people turn to uh, when they need advice or they need help. Um, and so, these sorts of things really depend on a lot of things, like your personality type and what drives you and what sorts of things you have fun doing. Because if you're pursuing a path and you're not having fun doing it, you're not too likely to be successful if you're competing with people who are on that same path and are having fun doing what they're doing. So you know, if you're not a social person, you're trying to succeed among social people, um, that might be, it might be good to find a path where you can target your own, extra, you know, what, what you have fun doing. So knowing yourself and where you can shine just makes a lot of difference in determining how lucky you can be. And uh, sort of identifying that early on is one of the things that we found as being very important when we're researching our book. Great. No, that, that's, that's really fascinating and highly recommend the book. Like I thought it was like, um, you know, hugely like interesting and um you know ac actually like empowering in some ways so um highly recommend Thank it for you. anyone listening <laughs> yeah right. that's why i wrote i really want it to be beneficial to people and there's a lot of luck out there to be made and most people don't make all the luck that they deserve to have so um my hope in in, in doing some of the research for that is trying to expose some of those many ways that we can make luck every single day by seeing opportunities that we might miss, by being proactive, by taking action. And um, I have a soft spot for helping others. You know, when we help others, uh, we create value in the world uh, and we create luck for others. And a lot of luck is actually socially created. We like to think that, 
you know, we're responsible for making our own luck. But if you actually think about the times you've been lucky in your life, a lot of it comes from other people who have given you a chance or who have been there in the right place at the right time to be able to help you. And so I'm a really big proponent of um, using any time you have to try to help others. No, I, I definitely agree with that. And, um, you know, just from in Givology, we noticed that, like, you know, volunteers, like, you may be contributing your time, but you build network and skills, and that helps you in, in life and and, um, and and just from an overall sense of, like, self-satisfaction as well. Yeah, you feel better about things, and you're also, you're learning along the way, too. You know, you're, you're seeing what works and what doesn't work, and sometimes when that big break does come your way, you know, chances do happen. Uh, you want to be prepared for it. And the best way to prepare it sometimes is by having a lot of practice and seeing a lot of things and helping others, you know, to gain their big breaks. Yeah. And speaking of big breaks, like, um, you know, especially since, like, we work with a lot of grassroots organizations that, you know, have, like, you know, very important missions but often find themselves, like, very underfunded and very scrappy and fighting, um, you know, to fund you know, tuitions and um, salaries and a bunch of new program expenses. Drawing from your research on luck, what can, you know, nonprofits and, you know, potentially Givology partners who may be listening to today's podcast do to make themselves luckier to help scale both, like, fundraising, visibility, to overall, like, improve their, and, and impact um, their communities more more greatly? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And, um, it's a lot of things, but definitely um, it sort of you know, it comes back to engagement of people and ideas, sort of this idea that we started with. Um, you know, when it comes to fundraising, one can ask questions about that, you know, in terms of what's really needed, what aspects of, you know, do you really need that full amount that you're targeting? Can you raise uh, in-kind support? what other types of activities of peers can be leveraged or even how can each dollar be stretched further. So something I see a lot in the philanthropic space is that huge amounts of effort go into raising the funds. And there's a lot of apprehension around that and sometimes fear. Um, and it might be something like, you know, buying medicine or something like that to help people. But then you see on the, on the spend side, you don't see as much effort sometimes. So you don't see, you know, negotiations uh, over, over over the buying of different types of equipment, for instance, and um, uh, negotiations with uh, key business partners and so forth. So I really think looking at the whole picture and thinking of how to be most efficient and effective uh, works in so many ways to the advantage of the organization and makes the fundraiser, fundraising a, a lot easier. And um, on that note, I think that also the focus on adding value and the visibility of results is really important because great organizations are sometimes easy, you know, able to fundraise a lot easier because they of the inspiring message that they have. And that's really what people care about is, you know, what's happening in the world. So if there's a focus on that and the mission and what's happening – the funds often follow, especially if you're connected to the right people who are in a position to help. Um, so I think that you know, we're entering a period where there is a lot of you know, wealth out there and people are wondering how uh, to go from success to significance. And one of, the, one of the greatest ways you can do that is be involved in a nonprofit cause or causes that you care about. Like give money, but also give time effort, you know, be generous in terms of connectivity with others who could help. And, um, and that goes, you know, with along, you know, with the people who are in the nonprofit itself, you know, just getting out there, being visible, uh, spreading enthusiasm for your idea and, um, and good things happen. Choice. Yeah, I've seen it again and again. Yeah, no, I, I, um, no, I definitely agree. With you. I think donations of time and skills and is just as important, if not even more important, than money. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, um, you know, as we close on the um, on on this podcast, is there any message that you want to leave for our listeners? 
Well, just one of optimism. I mean, all, all the opportunity is waiting to be created out there. So um, I'm a big believer in you know, saying, you know, helping others, making the most of the time we have, because in that time, there's always a lot of different ways to make possibilities uh, and to learn. So um, I'm very optimistic about you know the, the whole not prof, not for profit sector in terms of creating new types of solutions, and it's just a matter of you know getting out there and uh, doing all you can and being a positive a positive force in the world. So um, really grateful that uh, we have a chance to discuss some of these topics, and I hope that you know Giveology uh, will continue to grow and continue to inspire people and to be um, you know, as effective as they can uh, in whatever they hope to do in the, in the area. Great. Thank you. Uh, we really appreciate your time, Dr. Marsh, and um, the inspiring message of optimism and engagement. And so uh, thank you so much. Um, you know, uh, we, I think our listeners will learn a lot from this, from this podcast. Well, thank you, Joyce. It's been a pleasure. Okay.